Peace and blessings, Israel. May the Most High in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yahweh Shai in the Hebrew. Bless you all. All praises. My name's Brother Aram, and Lord willing, today we'll be going over a topic uh, concerning marriage, right? And in particular, you know, when one goes to come together with someone, should they come together with one who's a non-believer, right? Right. So this is a specific question. Should we marry unbelievers, right? And the condition that we're trying to believe in the gospel of Christ. All right. And so let's go at the scriptures. Pretty good scriptures lined up. All praises. But should we marry unbelievers? That's the question. And before we get into it, let's say a quick prayer. Lord willing. And then we'll get right on into it. All praises. Most high in the name of Christ, have mercy upon us and bless us as we come together. Let your Holy Spirit be upon us that we may receive thy word unto edification, unto eternal life. All praises. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you. Amen. All right, Israel. So should we marry unbelievers, right? A lot of times people say you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> but this question is, for po is posed to those that do know, right? Because the scriptures speak about um, to whom much is given, much shall be required, right? So once the Heavenly Father have us in this faith and we're responsible for, for that which he's teaching us, he's teaching us for a reason, so we can move forward in a positive, righteous manner. He's not teaching us so it can go one in, ear, in one ear and out the other ear, or so that we can go backwards, right, and do the things of this secular world, right? And this is all for our own good, okay? This is not for him. This is for us. He's the most high, and we're men and women upon earth, so he's our teacher. We're not his teacher, right? All praises. And so let's head to Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th uh, verse to the 28th verse. Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th verse to about the 28th verse. Um, bear with me for one second. All right. Just got to do one thing. But in the meantime, we head into Genesis 1.26. Let's understand a few scriptures per pertaining to marriage as a foundation. Okay, let's get a foundation going. Let's hear from the scriptures. What is marriage? All right, so in Genesis 1, in the day of creation, the Most High created male and female. He also created marriage. Marriage was instituted, right, in the day man and women were created. So Genesis 1, 26, let's get to the verse. Hold on. All right, right over here. So it says, and God said, let us make man in our image. So the us and the our is the most high God and the son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay. Other scriptures, they're known as the Godhead or the administration. So the Most High being over all things has Christ carry out his orders, his bidding. Christ is over everything else except the Most High. So the powers, or say God, the powers said, let us make man in our image. Right? After our likeness. So that image or representation or likeness starts with righteousness. We're going to create man and woman. We're going to start with man, meaning Adam, in our likeness, righteousness. And because the Most High was immortal, Christ is immortal, we're going to make man without death. So man was created immortal, right? After our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, 
and over every creeping thing, right, that creepeth upon the earth. So man was made to be the dominant species in the creation that the Most High have created. So the powers, or God created man in his own image. In the image of the powers, or God, right? In the Hebrew, you hear the word Allahayim. But we, we're going to read it in English because we speak English. So it says, in the image of God created he him, right? So man, meaning Adam, was created as a representation of the Most High and his Christ, meaning Yahweh Shai, the Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? Then he say, male and female created he them. So in the beginning, there's only two genders, male and female, created he them. So Adam was the first man created, and then the Most High created the rest of mankind afterwards. Right? And the powers blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So when he created male and female, he created them under the institution of marriage. And he called marriage a blessing. That's why I said in the 28th verse, and God blessed them now that marriage is instituted between a male and his female. And he said unto them, now when you come together in the sanctity of marriage, you to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, right? So that's how it was originally set up by the law of God. Now what society has done since then doesn't make it right. They're doing it, but it doesn't make it right. Boyfriend, girlfriend, my boo, we hanging out. Uh, we just kicking it all these terms that this secular world have uh, made to diminish the law of God, truly to diminish the law of God. I've actually heard the wicked of this society who sit in power, of in, who have sit in seats of influence, said we need to diminish the view on marriage and we now need to trick society to not look at marriage as an important thing but just come sex as an important thing right when we know according to god sex is part of the marriage but it's not the most important part of the marriage the most important part of the marriage is being on one accord with your creator with his beliefs not our beliefs, not your beliefs, and anyone else's beliefs. Because who joined man and female and female to go together? The creator. So they was to come together on one accord uh, based on his image and his likeness. We to represent righteousness in the earth. Fornication, brothers and sisters, is not righteousness, Right? Right? And I'm only saying it because, you know, when we teach, we only speak the facts. We don't condemn. We have to just speak the facts and then let the brothers and sisters that hear the information make the proper decisions in, according to the scriptures. Or they can keep on moving in their own, uh, how should we say, decision making. That's particularly on them. But our job is to put the information in your lap. This is what the Lord says. Marriage was created from the beginning. Man and woman were supposed to represent him. Any type of coming together where they were to be fruitful and multiply was done in the sanctity of the blessing of marriage. Right? So the Most High had Christ to institute marriage in the day man was created. All praises. So now Genesis 2 is a repeat of Genesis 1. So let's head to Genesis 2 and let's get some further detail of when the Most High had the first marriage between Adam and Eve. So we're going to head to Genesis 2 and 18. Right? Genesis 2 verse 18. 
Let's check it out. And there we go. So we in the book of Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man, right, the man they created, which was Adam, should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So you see, very basic scripture, but a lot of information in there. Who created Adam? The Most High. Who created his spouse? The Most High. Who's making that join, that union? The Most High. A lot of good information right there. Right? The Most High is the one. He's the matchmaker. The Most High is the one that said a man should not be alone. The Most High is the one that's about relationships. He promotes relationship. But the proper relationships, Israel, right? Not on again, off again. Domestic abuse. Idols. Breaking the Sabbath. Like, that coming together, that's not in <laughs> the scriptures, right? So this coming together, he promotes a righteousness. Where the man should not be alone, it is proper that he needs one that supports him. When I say help, meet, meet, this term meet in the uh, uh, Middle English, right? Middle English um, means appropriate or accustomed, right? So for every male, he should be accustomed his proper female, right? And she's to support that man. Take care of that man, right? Cook, clean, love that man, raise his children. All this information is in the Bible. Who cares what society have told us and made it like that was somehow uh, <laughs> evil? No, the male's purpose in life and the woman's purpose in life is always outlined in the Holy Bible. The fact that society went away from it, that's not the Most High's fault. Matter of fact, we should be repenting and, and returning back to the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding. And don't fall away. All right. And so we'll skip from Genesis 2.18. Let's skip to the 21st verse. Okay. Turn the page. Genesis 2.21. So like I said, Genesis 2 is a repeat of Genesis 1 but it just gives you a little further detail, right? So in bringing male and female together and bringing Adam together with his wife, it was the most high's plan that said, I don't want man to be alone. I want man to have a companion. I want man to be married. The right way, right? So 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God have taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So who brought the woman to the most high, the Lord God? And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So that's not literal, <laughs> right? She ain't inside of him. But the closest you can get to being yourself is somebody that's your own bones and flesh and so on. So what we gather out of that uh, was his statement. He's saying, we on one accord. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. See, see what goes on into the marriage? That's why I wanted to read the second chapter. There's more to just coming together with a woman. Y'all need to be on one accord. One flesh. What's the agreement? One accord. What's the agreement? The very God that brought them together. We, you, like a male and his female, you to agree on the things that the creator have in store for us. So he said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Right? That's not taught in this society. What's taught in this society is to stay in your parents' house and act like you grown, but really, you know, you, you, we not doing it according to God. So, you know, we trying to be grown, but then we still being a child. 
So the proper way, again, we ain't condemning. We're just trying to bring the information out, and brothers and sisters have to make them root, those moves, right? Lord willing. So the proper way, when it was understood, you come to a marriageable age, able to provide for a wife and children, able to provide a roof over her head, able to provide warmth and, and, and food and shelter, Right? And you're all doing this with the blessing of the Most High God. Right? And shall cleave unto his wife, because before he even left in his parents' house, he was cleaving to his parents. But now he's the start of family of his own. So him and his wife is what? And they shall be one flesh, one agreement. One agreement. Two people, but move as one person. So then what possibly could be the agreement? Right? We know the Bible is not a guessing game. <laughs> so, you know, it's a rhetorical question, meaning a question where we already know the answer. The agreement would always was always going to be Adam and Eve following God. Right? And then the generations to come coming out of that, follow God. Follow the word of the Most High through his Christ. That's what we're supposed to be in agreement with. Right? But we just had to establish marriage was instituted from the very beginning, Israel. You ain't never going to read boyfriend, girlfriend, my boo. We shacking up. We hooking up. We just friends. You're not going to read all that. You're going to read either marriage or the opposite, fornication, something we should never be, should never be once named among you as become of saints, right? There's a scripture like that, right? So the, whatever mistakes we done made in the past, when it's time to learn of Christ, we got to put all that away and become a new person in Christ, right? All praises. But now let's head to Malachi, which is right before Matthew. Let's head to the book of Malachi 2 and 11. It's going to speak concerning what was said in Genesis. Very good information, Israel. They're not teaching us this in society because when, man, when a man and his wife represent righteousness, that's too much power. That's too much power, right? Now, I want to get ahead of myself and say things that people may not understand, but too much righteousness in the earth shuts the devil down. So the devil can't have that. So what he does is he promotes the masses of people to promote wickedness. Because when you promote wickedness, it keeps a negative energy, negative spirits, negative vibration. But when you do the things of God, it promotes the opposite. It promotes righteousness, positive spirits, positive energy coming from above. And that diminishes Satan. Right? So the influence has to be satanic. He can't have an influence of righteousness in the earth. So that's why he caters to man's lust and everything you see in the music and the movies and the TV or whatever else, social media, is sex and lust and, and foolishness. Because he got to keep you away from this righteousness. But the Most High in these last days have wake, start to wake up his people. And so we to be that group to transcend wickedness and, and return unto the righteousness because the future world is going to be about this. So we can dismiss it for those that don't want to listen. We can dismiss it, right? Oh, the Bible is, is hooey pooey. But come kingdom time, guess what's going to run the earth? The Bible. So you either get it right now before, <laughs> before judgment day or we can keep playing and think that you know, this society is the real society that's going to last forever. And if you believe that, we got a bridge to sell you. <laughs> this is a temporary society where wickedness is playing out its course. And so we're heading to Malachi. I'm trying to get there, but they're giving me every chapter <laughs> except Malachi. Bear with me. Uh, this, this bigger Bible. Here we go. So we're in the book of Malachi 2. And 11, and it's going to speak on what was said 
in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So it said Judah, right? This was a region in Israel where you had Judah, Benjamin, Levi. They called it Judea. Judah happens to be one of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But it also can be commonly known as a region. Southern Israel, Judea, southern Israel. So in the south, not limited to the south, but in the south of Israel, Judah have dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. So what were they doing wrong? For Judah have profaned the what? The holiness, what did it call marriage? The holiness of the Lord, which he loved and have married the daughter of a strange God. So right there, the Lord used the prophet Malachi to, to call marriage that was instituted from the beginning. It's called the whole, one of the things of the holiness of the Lord. Does society dictate that to us? No. They make it the opposite, that if you get married, you somehow stuck, you trapped. It's wickedness, man. It's wickedness, brothers, sisters. Don't believe that. So what did they do wrong in Judea? They were marrying the woman of another nation. That's against the scriptures. Okay, we got 12 tribes of our people. Got plenty to pick, pick from. You got the so-called black, the so-called Hispanic, the so-called Native American Indian, you, right? But these brothers decide we're going to marry non-Israelite woman and start marrying other women, right? Chinese or so-called European or African woman. Or, that's wrong. Can't do that. Okay, the Most High, when he created men in the beginning, he created all men with their own women from their own nation to reproduce their own nation to be fruitful and multiply. That's the beauty of it. We weren't supposed to deal with what they call today interracial marriage, right? Now, when you don't even know who you are and what people you come from, according to the Bible, this is also part of the confusion, right? So we teach classes specific on who we are. We're the nation of Israel, man, God's people, right? Twelve tribes of us, so-called black, so-called uh, Hispanic, like Puerto Rican, Mexican, Dominican, uh, El Salvadorian, Guat Guatemalan, uh, Colombian. Listen, we got a lot to choose from, right? So what was these brothers doing? They fell for the trap. So the Lord didn't like that. He said, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the, man, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offered an offering unto the Lord of hosts. So you had the, the leadership doing it, and the ones who offered the offering, the priests doing it. Once the youth see that, they're going to follow that. The Lord didn't like this, right? Because then the young generation is going to follow this. So check out what he's saying. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, nor or receiveth it with good will at your hand. So all the prayers and the sacrifices, the Lord didn't want to deal with none of that because they were just sinning on purpose and think the Lord should answer their prayer. Yet ye say, wherefore? Why, Lord? Why ain't they, you answering our prayer? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. So when we marry, right, you marry that virgin, right? That, that's the wife of your youth, right? That man leave father and mother, and they go to have a family they own, y'all growing together. Y'all building a relationship upon the foundation of Christ, man. That's a powerful thing, brother, sisters. But what is these brothers doing? The Lord witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. So they were putting their Israelite wives to the side. That's treacherous, right? Cutting them off, putting them away. Yet is she thy companion, no matter what the brother's opinion was. The Lord say, technically on the record or on the books, your Israelite wife has always been your wife and the wife of thy covenant. See, because marriage is a covenant, Israel. Okay, according to the law of God, we, writ, we wrote covenants. The parents would meet up with the family of, of, of 
the spouse, right? And covenants would be written. Not a ring and a guy going to one knee, making himself subservient to his wife. No, 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 no. That's this. See, that's a lot of ritualistic things that's towards the negativity of, of how this world gets down. But according to the Bible, there was no ring. There was covenants. And there was gifts. And, 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 and basically, the biggest gift is a brother and sister that come together to be aged together in the sanctity of marriage following that one doctrine, that, that, that the God of Israel, all praises. That's the blessing, man. So these brothers was messing that up. So how do you, make, how do you think these sisters felt? <laughs> Their husband done left them for another nation, and they out on, on, on the outs. 15 verse. And did not he make one? See, so this is going to refer back to when marriage was first instituted. Did not he make one, meaning they shall be one flesh, one accord, one agreement in Christ? Yet had he the residue of the spirit and wherefore one. So check it out. When it said the holiness of the Lord, here he's repeating it, but he's saying it a different way. When the Lord instituted marriage, that was a piece of his spirit, like residue. That was emanating residue of his Holy Spirit. And why did he do it? Why did he make the male and female one flesh? Being a representation, right? His likeness. That he might seek a godly seed. I mean, our generations are supposed to be godly. That's why a man and a woman comes together, Israel. To be godly, not to just hook up for the sake of hooking up. The world tricked us, man. When a man sees a female, you're supposed to think of the most high God, and you're supposed to think of family. But that's not what society teaches us. Society tells the sisters to be half-dressed, promote all their private parts, and tell the brothers to, be, to, to walk around and be a, a sexual deviant and, and chase after sexual conquests. No. According to God, you see a woman, brother. You see a companion for life. You see a, a, a one who's bound to you in godliness and righteousness. You see one that you're supposed to take care of, man. Look out for her. Not someone you verbally abuse, you know, physically abuse, physically manipulate, right? Now we don't do these things, Ezra. You know, verbally manipulate the sister. Be tyrannical. Nah. So... <laughs> You know, there's a lot we got to learn before we get with a sister. Same thing for sisters, right? Learn of God. So it says, therefore, take heed to your spirit. See, their spirit was out of order. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. So what do we gather? When you put your woman away, man, that's treacherous. Ask society if that's how they see it. Well, uh, y'all together? No, well, we not together. Well, why not? Oh, uh, you, that used to be my boyfriend. I used to be, but, but you know, it didn't work out. So, you know, we on to the next fornication. See, it's just, it's a game to them. And who's cracking up at this? The devil. Because we defiling ourselves, Israel. So the Lord don't want that for us. So he wants us to be bigger and do better things, right? For the Lord, the God of Israel said that he put, he hateth putting away. For one cover of violence with his garment, saying the Lord of hosts, say if the Lord of hosts, excuse me, therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So this, this society where, you know, people have done been on to their 16th sexual partner, some of them 50th, like what are we doing? It's, it's, it's so far removed from the holiness that the Lord instituted from the beginning, man. The Lord ain't with this, okay? All that's fornication. The Lord ain't with any of that, Israel. And the society ain't in a hurry to help us out and show us the right way. Only the Lord. So let's head to Mark 10 where we get the same information, but directly out of Christ's mouth. Mark, the 10th chapter. And from the first verse to the 12th verse. The Lord was never about a man and a woman coming together only so that they can go separate ways 
sometime later. That ain't never in the scriptures. But men and women did it. Don't make it right. So let's try to be the group to do it right. As there's so much evil in the earth, there's got to be good in the earth. So what side of the coin we want to be? All right. So and we can do all things in Christ Jesus that strengthen us, man. We don't have to follow society and be a follower. We got to be leaders. We got to lead by example. And whatever we did wrong in the past, that's in the past when we repent. And try to do that which is right in the sight of God. No one can talk against that then. Because God is with you. But if we're going to continue in the foolishness and in the wickedness, then we only have ourselves to blame. We can blame everybody else, but at the end of the day, God looking at us. And when the information go out, we on the hook for it. Because to whom much is given, much shall be required. We can't say we didn't know. Yeah, you were shown the scriptures. So hold your stuff in your pants. And for the sisters, <laughs> keep yourself and wait for the Lord. Like I say, the Lord was the one that bring the marriage. He knows what he's doing. Let's trust in him. We done trusted in everything else. How, how'd that help? How'd that go? <laughs> right? It's time to trust in him. So Mark 10, first verse to the 12 verse. Let's read it. And he arose, meaning Christ arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. See, he would teach the Bible. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? So they didn't really want the real answer. They, they trying to trip him up on how he's going to answer it. Right? And when you read about this religious group, the Pharisees, they had big time problems and jealousy and all kinds of stuff going on against Jesus Christ. So Christ know the game. So third verse, and he answered and said unto them, what did Moses command you? Because remember, the first five books of the Bible, the Lord have Moses to write it. So what does it say in the Holy Scriptures? Going back to the beginning. And they said, well, Moses suffered or allowed to write a bill of divorce, divorcement and to put her away. So see, they playing games, right? They quoting um, a scripture out of Deuteronomy 24, but they not telling the full information because the Lord is against putting away. So check out how Christ say this. And Yahweh answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, right? When somebody's hard headed, meaning rebellious, <laughs> for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, meaning the Lord allowed or tolerated a situation where a man who didn't understand marriage, and he going to put his woman away, right, unnecessarily, the Lord did that to save the sisters, right? That way you're not tied to a guy who don't truly love you, and he just, when someone don't love you, they're going to show it because people show you who they are. They're going to show you. They're not going to have genuine care for you. They're going to tear you down, right? Anytime you get ready to lead them and see them for who they are, then they're going to now switch and, and <laughs> right? And, and lather you with gifts and tell you nice words and flattering words, right? Because they don't want you to leave on your terms. They wanted you to leave when they're ready. They want to just use you. Right? That's an evil spirit that knows how to trick man to do these things to hurt people. Right? Those are spirits. Right? And so moving forward, right, the Lord protect the sisters and allowed that precept to be written. What did Christ say in the sixth verse? But from the beginning of the creation, because Christ would know who was in the creation with God. Christ. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, meaning the institution of marriage. Right? So you're asking me, is it okay for a man to come together only to put her away? What kind of Bible y'all reading? We need to go back to the basics. That's what he said. We need to go back to the beginning, Israel. 
What was the purpose of the Most High making male and female? It is not good that man should be alone. The other scripture said this was the holiness of the Lord. So the Lord is all about marriage. Why would you ask me about divorce, right? So he said, for this cause or this very cause that he instituted marriage, shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. So the sixth verse was quoting Genesis 1. The seventh verse was quoting Genesis 2. That's why we read those scriptures. See, it's quoting, give you the scriptures right here and right here. See Genesis 1 here in the precept. Genesis 2 right there in the other precept. We read both of them. So Christ was promoting what was set up originally from the beginning, thus telling us we need to go back to the beginning as believers. Okay, a verse. And they twain, meaning two persons, the male and his female, shall be one flesh, one agreement. That agreement's supposed to be God. So then they are no more twain, meaning two separate individuals with two separate thoughts, but one flesh. What therefore who? God have joined together. So who joins a male and a female together? God. Let not man put asunder, meaning the man or the woman in that relationship doesn't have the right to put it asunder because God joined it together. Right? When you read about Abraham and his wife, Sarah, Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, Jacob and his wife, right? He had, well, his main wife was, um, Rachel, right? And you think about these brothers, right? And so for the, I mentioned Jacob, but that was a, that was a, a case where he was allowed to have four women because his, he served a role of reproducing the 12 tribes of Israel. So he had 12 sons across four wives. Okay, so that's a, that's a little distinct type case. But the point is, what therefore God have joined together, let not man put asunder. Abraham never had the right to put Sarah away because he feel like it. Isaac never had the right to put Rebecca away because he feel like it. Right? So he said, and in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he said unto them, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, commit of adultery against her. So that adultery is one of the forms of fornication. So if, you just, so if we just hooking up with people, right, thinking that, that you know, boyfriend, girl, or whatever, this, you're setting up adulterous situations. Who's the only one standing to gain from that? Because it ain't us. So the devil's cracking up at us in our ignorance because when we're doing these things, it shows a lack of wisdom and understanding. He takes advantage of us. And we get all these unnecessary sorrows, right? We get dysfunctional families. We get children who grow up without the proper protection of a father and mother together on, in one flesh. There's power in that, right? Because the children are going to go by what they see. But if the child sees that his daddy's not around because he got another family and a third family and a fourth family, kids all over the place, he's going to repeat it. You see? And who wants us to do that? Satan. So again, we don't condemn. Because some of us come from them situations. Right? Where we got brothers and sisters from because <laughs> daddy done got around. Right? So that's not the, the point of the message. The point of the message, God, can, God convicts the person in their heart to want to change. That's why the information comes out. Now, the person don't want to change, and that's a whole other set of scriptures for that where you choose, you make your choices, but just know you have to answer for those choices. That's all. No one, listen, God doesn't twist our arm. Okay, all right. So 12 verse, and if a woman shall put away her husband, let's say the woman decide she don't want to be with her husband anymore, right? Rebecca said, I don't want to deal with Isaac no more. I got my eyes set on this other homeboy, right? Really? Okay and be married to another, she committed for adultery, right? So then it's never truly a marriage. So Malachi 2 was a good scripture because even though those brothers got with those women of a strange God, because it goes back to the law, 
we weren't supposed to marry women of other nations because those women were tied to other gods. That's one of the reasons. That ain't the only reason, but that's one of the reasons. Right? So even though those men did that, the Lord put the thing back in order. He said, you don't put your Israelite woman away, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. No matter what you calling this other female, this is your wife over here. Y'all better repent. And there was times in the scriptures where the Lord didn't just give them a talking to. Certain brothers died. <laughs> right? What was said in Malachi, they got a talking to. But there was a time in other parts of the scriptures, like when you read in Numbers 25, you messing with the woman that don't belong to you, them, them brothers died, man. Right? So it depends. You might not die. You might just get a slow death, get all that calamity where you're getting into relationships that don't necessarily belong to you. And all this information been in the Bible, Israel. You see? And so let's go from there. Let's go to Amos. Right? Amos, let's back it up. The book of Amos, the third chapter and the third verse. Okay, Amos, the third chapter. All right, we want that third chapter and the third verse. Every time we read marriage, we read about one flesh, right? Being on one accord. So here's a, here's a proverb, like a wise saying. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Think about that. Right? Marriage is an agreement. It's a covenant. What, what, what is your agreement? Right? Well, according to how it was instituted, your agreement, meaning your, your, your one direction, your one foundation, was always your creator. The one who created you. The one who joined you together. The one that says, let you not put what I gave you asunder, right? You'd love that woman, cherish that woman like a man love himself. He'd love his wife. That's in Ephesians 5. But see, society ain't teaching the generations that. These songs and these videos, and everything, they teaching you. The, the word love is thrown around so foolishly and wickedly. It's very deceptive because it's not love. It's it's. Temporary lust at the moment. Sensuality. Love is not that. Love is much more than that. Love is when that woman is, is vomiting and because she, she's in her sixth or seventh month of pregnancy or her third month of pregnancy. Love is cleaning that thing up. <laughs> right? Love is helping that woman when she's carrying your child. Love is when that man is uh, struggling, trying to find employment or doing whatever, and she's supporting him, trying to help him, rather than she on the couch with him playing video games and ain't nobody got a plan to bring some income in the house properly. You see what I'm saying? So love goes a long way, but most of all, love is the keeping of the commandments of God. Tell us that in 1 John 5 and 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So when we don't know the commandments, how are we truly abiding in the love? We're injuring one another. And that's exactly what goes on in these relationships. And it'd be tolerable until one or the other had enough and they use it as an excuse to move on to the next. But it's funny that until... You didn't until your lust was fulfilled. You tolerated the other one's uh, disagreeable things that you don't like that you're using now to separate. You see what I'm saying? So it's just a mess. And the devil, the devil is the author of confusion. God is not. Okay, so you can't be together unless you agreed. Now we either gonna agree in God or we gonna agree in the devil. Which one? But you're going to agree. And that's where, when we have these relationships where the agreement is breaking the commandments of God, 
Then you see where you get all the sorrow, all the despair, all the anxiety, all the anger, all the child court, all the domestic abuse and the handcuffs, all the ER where the, the woman is injured, all the foolishness, and then the children seeing this, these violent outbursts, or these people cheating on each other. What do you think they're learning? You see what we're talking about? Okay, so can two walk together lest they be agreed, man? Let's head to 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Okay, 2 Corinthians towards the uh, back, 6, 14. All right, so the scriptures speak about when we come to Christ, we just stay in the simplicity of Christ. A lot of these scriptures are simple, but what makes it hard is when we we cater to our lusts, right? We give in to our lusts. And society is all about that because the scripture says, for all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? So they all about putting things in front of your eyes so you can lust, you can fall into temptation, right? But once you start to learn these scriptures and that Holy Spirit working through you, through the scripture, you're going to have every scripture for all the temptation you're about to face, right? Because all men get tempted, all women get tempted. It ain't just in, tempted to just one thing, it's a bunch of things. You get tempted to go after other gods, you get tempted to steal, lie, cheat, you get tempted to fornicate, you get tempted to break the Sabbath, all kinds of things. But we got scriptures for everything, and that's what keeps the believer uh, like it says, for he that is born of God doth not sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Right? When God is in you through that word, right? Born again by that seed, meaning not of uh, corruptible seed, but incorruptible, by the word of the Holy One, the word of God. That's what prevents us from falling to temptation, but rather conquering temptation. Right? Enduring temptation. Right, so Second Corinthians, sixth chapter, fourteen verse, was to tell us, "Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers." So if it's telling us that in common day life, right, be not in agreement with those who don't believe the same. You know it's talking about that when it comes to marriage. For what fellowship have righteousness with, with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? Right? It's polar opposites. And what concord or agreement have Christ with Belial, meaning the devil, the devil? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? Infidel is a way to say a non-believer. There is no agreement. Right? So think about it. Here you as a brother trying to learn the scriptures and you start to learn different things con concerning the commandments. you trying to keep the Sabbath. Are you going to hook up with a sister? Come Sabbath time, she breaking the Sabbath. you trying to refrain from following holidays and different things that's to the idols of, of this world. She still want to do Christmas or Valentine's Day or Mother's Day, or birthday celebration. How are you with that? That's the, that's the question. You see the question mark? So it's simple, the simplicity in Christ. But we make it hard because say, well, I see, I don't see these scriptures no more. I see the woman's beauty. And then the scriptures be out the window. And then for a lot of brothers and sisters that's already in the faith, then once they make that mistake of falling into the temptation, then they try to make the other person righteous. When that come from above, the Lord is the one to wake a brother or sister up to the, to the truth. You don't move too fast and put yourself in a situation that you don't belong. So now trying to make it work and make it work and make it work and it, and it keeps showing that it ain't going to work. What ends up happening, it could draw you out to faith, Israel. That's how dangerous it is. Because you move before letting God join together. Right? So it says, and what agreement have the temple of God with idols? 
for ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Right? So the most high is supposed to dwell in us, righteousness. What are we doing? Joining ourselves, because marriage is a union. We joining ourselves physically and mentally and spiritually to a spouse that God don't have don't want no business with the truth for the most high. We are asking for danger. We asking for problems. We asking for sorrow and tears in the middle of the night. We asking for the police to come up knocking at your door. We asking for the family of the non-believer to treat you a certain kind of way because you trying to stay hold to the beliefs. Yeah, but it's mixed message. So what's the r real answer? Don't get involved with that. You see? Don't get involved with that, Israel. Okay, go to this one. It's in the Apocrypha. Uh, where's my Apocrypha at? Uh, here it is. Ecclesiasticus 26, 22. We're coming upon the end of the class, but I want to at least read this. Uh, before we go to Ecclesiastes, right, since we're in Corinthians, back it up one thing. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 6 and 9. And then Corinthians 7, there is a situation or a type of scenario where one may be joined to an unbeliever. But those are under different circumstances, so we'll try to cover that as well. Okay, but 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, because we can deceive ourselves. You see the pretty woman or the female, she'll see the guy that she's physically attracted to. Yeah, but that don't mean you're supposed to be attracted to that. Now it's, it's become lust. So don't fool yourself. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. What's a fornicator? The opposite of marriage, right? So you have different forms of fornication. You got uh, one night stands. You got boyfriend, girlfriend, where there's no, no God in place. To, to <laughs> The most high God is not in place. So it's just you hooking up with somebody. Right? Some people call it casual sex. Some people call it boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever they want to call it. You got uh, being a sodomite, being a lesbian. You got bestiality. You got incest. You got uh, interracial marriage. All those, when you actually line them up, if you was to put a list of all the scriptures, those are the different forms of fornication. You don't get with a woman just for the sake of getting one. That's fornication, Israel. You're supposed to trust and wait on the Lord. That way, when you do come with the woman, you know it's right because the Lord did it for you. And you both believe having that one foundation. Christ is that foundation, keeping his commandments and raising up a godly seed, Israel. Right? So be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. What's effeminate? A man who shows feminine tendencies like a woman. No abusers of themselves with mankind. That's one who lay men with men and women with women. You didn't abuse yourself. No thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. See, that should be your past. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. When is this? When we repent from those things. So now we single and we in this faith, the last thing we should be doing is going back to the fornication, going back to the adultery, going back to the foolishness. That's the difference, Israel. Now, now you see why we say we don't condemn? Because the law says such was some of you. So he give you a chance to get it right. All right, all praises. So now when you read Corinthians 7, since we me uh, mentioned about you may have a situation where a brother and a sister were already together before they heard of this faith. Now how do you handle that? 
right? They were already together. They were both in the world, not knowing Christ. And then one learns of Christ, but the other not so fast to agree to that. How do you handle that? Okay, this is a different situation. But the class was specific to when you're single, should you just casually hook up with anybody They're not, and they're non-believers? The answer is no. You could try, but you're going to catch lumps, brother, sister. Now, in the case where two are already in that world, the object is to have both in the faith, right? But Paul had to answer it in a wise way, so check out what he says in 1 Corinthians 7 and 1. Now, concerning the things wherever he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, meaning not to get involved with a woman on any level, right? Stay single. Why is he saying this? To stay single forever? No, of course not. Because he knows the most high promoted marriage. So why would he say that? No, what he's saying is stay by yourself, right? For what reason? Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. That's the reason. You're better off by yourself than to fornicate. Let every man have his own what? Wife. And let every woman have her own what? Husband. So he didn't say stay by yourself and do nothing. He says stay by yourself to avoid fornication. Then, based on your prayer and patience and getting yourself built up in this faith, the Lord bring you the proper wife for a brother or the proper uh, husband for a wife, I mean for a sister. Excuse me. Right? So it says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, meaning kindness. Right? Do meaning that's what's owed to a, from a husband to a wife. You deal kind with her. Spend time with her. We talk scriptures. We go for walks. We, we have fun together. Right? But our relationship is Bible-based. And that's what gives it lasting power, Israel. Well, everybody else talking about they ain't love, here, give it some time. But the ones that's truly in love and the ones that's truly uh, going to have that lasting power is the ones that the Lord bless the way he say to do it, right? So learn the benevolence, brothers. Why are you single? You learn it from the scriptures. And come due time, you'll be having to practice that with your wife and be you know have care genuine care man and likewise also the wife unto the husband so that's the spending time being intimate uh being friends right the husband and wife that's your best friend the wife have not power of her own body but the husband and likewise also the husband have not power of his own body but the wife so that means because we're no longer twain, we one flesh. I can't just do what I want, make a decision and such, such. Even though I'm over my wife, according to the law, there's decisions that I have to be wary of because I'm in this together with my wife and vice versa. I can't just say, hey, I saw a video where Arnold Schwarzenegger became a bodybuilder and then I go off to Germany or Belgium and go be a bodybuilder. Who's going to take care of my wife and kids, man? So now that now I'm, I'm like I'm an individual. That, so, so silly stuff like that, right? Or make bad financial decisions that's going to hurt the family. I'm no longer of my own body. I have to think about others and same thing for her. She has to think about her husband, her children, what's best for her family, according to God, right? So then it says, defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent for a time. So now he's speaking in a nice way of intimacy. Okay, Make sure you don't keep intimacy from each other unless it's consent or greed for a temporary time. Right, Things may come up. Right, Like, for example, he gives one, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So let's say, for example, that you guys are going through things it takes fasting and prayer and different things. So you may, that may, you know, be a legitimate reason to withhold sex from one another because you agree we need to do this spiritual thing and try to pray to the Lord and fast together. And it says, but what? And come together again, right? 
because part of the marriage is the intercourse, the sexual intercourse, right? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Incontinency means being in unstable, right? When you're in a relationship and the Lord made you male and female to come together in marriage, and we not spending time with one another, we not providing time for one another, we got time for everything else, that's when the devil gets in. And that's where the adultery comes in, that's where the foolishness comes in. And you wondering why the man, now he taking a bath again and he's smelling good and he coming home any hours of the night, something's going on, right? Or the woman, she she in the bed with a potato sack, right? And she's always tired and her stomach hurt and all this stuff. And you say, well, what's going on? She's defrauding you. But yet, her time's not accounted for. Her whereabouts are not accounted for. She's coming back looking glad, ghetto fabulous. Where are you coming from? Right? And this is be these dysfunctional relationships where people are cheating on one another, cutting up. So for a husband and wife, be careful of that. That's what Paul gave that information. Make sure you, right, it's your responsibility to make time for one another. But if it's going to be my job, my this, my that, you don't understand marriage because you don't understand your priorities. Okay. All right, sixth verse. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So he is speaking of commandment, but he's giving an advice based off the commandment. He said, for I would that all men were even as myself, right? Single. But every man have his proper gift of God, one after this man and another after that, right? So he's saying, I wish that men would be single, obviously rather than fornicate. He said, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So we know what he means by that. So that you don't fornicate, stay single. But if they cannot contain, right, let them what? Marry. So it shows you he never said not to marry, not to stay, not to marry. He just said stay single till it's time for marriage. For it is better to marry than to what? Burn. See that? because he knew about Judgment Day. See that? And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But it, So didn't Christ say that? The man not to put his woman away and the wife not to put her husband away? But and if she depart, right, let her remain unmarried. So now he's giving advice. Let's say things get rocky in a relationship. There may be a time where they may have to separate, right? Or do what? Or be reconciled to her husband. If things get worked out, come on back, right? She don't mess with nobody. He don't mess with nobody. They work things out. They come on back. That's understandable. If it has to go to those extremes, that's tolerable. You don't really want that, but that's tolerable because no one fornicated. And let not the husband put away his wife. See that? So he's trying to stay, say, look, according to God, stay away from divorce. Stay away from walking from each other for good. Work things out. Give time for things to work out. And if it get too bad and it has to come to this extreme, then let that be the extreme where you separate for a time to only to be reconciled again. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not. Remember we talked about should we marry unbelievers. Well, going into it and you single, no, you should not marry unbelievers. But this is a case where they already marry. And you. this was what was going on back then. And it still goes on today, but this is what was going on back then. Where you have brothers and sisters in the temple and synagogues, Right? But yet not all of them believed that the Messiah was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Some of them looked for the Messiah to come when Christ already came. So now what do we do? The husband says, no, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that's the Messiah. The daughter says, well, I don't agree with that. I've been taught something else. So now what does he do? 
But to the rest speak I not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So she says, I don't see that right away. I'm, I'm still on the fence with that. I'm not as convinced as you are. But she's still being his wife and she's still being, you know, and he, it's, so he's to be patient with her. Don't put her away. Right? Let the Lord work. And the woman, see, reverse it. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not. Right? The woman may be in the faith before the husband is in this case. And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. See, don't go to that extreme of divorce. Don't do that. Y'all already married. The Lord is working. One of them is down with the Lord. Give it time for the other spouse. Don't divorce. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Meaning the example of the, of the, the believer can rub off on the unbeliever. That's what he's saying. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Because remember in Malachi, the husband and wife, that, that union brings forth the godly seed. So it's very important. You don't just run off. You got to be patient in those situations where you already came, you're already husband and wife. One learns of the truth before the other one. In that case, the believer has to be patient with the non-believer, especially when they're willing to work with you. They're just not seeing everything that you see at that moment. Now, you do have other groups who teach the Bible, and they make up their own judgmental rules. They don't believe? Get rid of them. That ain't what this Bible say. This Bible say be patient. Because just as the Lord woke you up, and, and what was you doing before that? You didn't believe. So the Lord woke you up, give it some time. He may wake them up. Now, 15 verses. But if the unbelieving depart, notice it said the unbeliever, not you, the unbeliever. says, I, I don't agree with this. I still want to break the Sabbath. I don't believe in no Sabbath. I still want to break the dietary law. I mean, I still want to eat pork and clams and shrimps and lobsters and, and pulpo, you know, octopus, right, in Spanish. Okay, well, we don't believe in that. That's not the scriptures. But they adamant, I ain't looking. I, I don't know what religion you in, right? They, they, they just not having it. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. So who's doing the departing, you or them? They are. You have no control over that. Long as you're being an example in Christ, if it goes a certain way, that's on them. Let it not be on you. That's what Paul is saying. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God have called us to peace. So in other words, the Most High doesn't want you tied to calamity, arguments, foolishness, uh, you know, riffraff and, and, and just clamor. He wants peace. But you can't see the future. So what is the advice telling us? For those that was already married, one came in the faith, the other one's not ready. Whether they'll ever be ready, that's you don't the, only the Lord know. And that all you can do is try to be an example. But you don't look for the depart. You don't do that. Because we already got the scriptures. With the Lord joined together, let not man put asunder. Right? So if the other person say, I'm out of here. I, I, I can't do this. Okay, I still want to live the life that I want to live. Uh, I ain't trying to follow that Bible you got. There's nothing you can do, man. You can try to appeal and talk and be kind and be patient, but that's on them. And that's all Paul was saying. Paul never said, go get another wife for the husband or... The wife, go get another husband. He, he's not allowed to say that. He's only dealing with this case to say, be patient and do everything you can to keep that marriage together and let the Lord work. But you got to be an example. and You got to be patient because it's going to be a test. It's going to be a test. You know, because a lot of people, they, they, they're not, they don't do good to change. You know, it takes a second. 
right? But when it comes to wickedness, they'll change quick. So that, that, But see, that's man's nature, carnal nature, and Christ trying to get us out of that. And so last scripture, uh, I, I mentioned it. But I had to read that 1 Corinthians 7 because someone say, well, I see what you're saying, like we're not supposed to marry unbelievers. But what are we already married? <laughs> All right, well, there's Scripture Corinthians 7 for that. <laughs> right? But going into it, the basic information, the knowledge of the Scriptures, when you're single, you don't go looking for non-believers, man. That, <laughs> you're going to catch trouble. Because when a man hook up with a woman, you're one flesh. And then the children are tied to that. If the children come out of the deal. So you want to be in order, Israel. Don't be in a hurry to just hook up with anybody. And don't try to make the people righteous. People show you who they are. Christ told us, you shall know a man by his fruits. But we so hasty and we just going after looks and how to, that sensuality. You don't know who you're getting with. Right? Especially these days, these people done been with men and women. <laughs> you don't know what that person's past is. Right? I know a brother right now, I don't know where he's at now at this very moment, but I knew a brother that knew he had an STD and was still going to the club passing that thing around to, to women. And they would never know. Because on the outside, he looked a certain way, and it was out of order, man. You see? So sisters don't be know who they're getting with. You got to be, if you in them scriptures, you ain't got to worry about none of that. Because the Lord is the matchmaker. And that's the scripture I want to read to conclude the class. Ecclesiasticus 26, verse 22. So when we impatient, we say, Lord, I don't believe you're the matchmaker. I'm going to make my own match. That's when we catch the problems. That's where we catch the problems. Right? And those problems, man, they they last for generations sometimes. Because by you getting with the wrong person, then you get children from the, for out of that situation. And, and sometimes, man, them children, man, the scriptures speak about, and I, I say sometimes, because again, we do not judge. We only lay out the information. The Lord is the judge. But a lot of times, one of the penalties for hooking up with people when you wasn't supposed to be with them. The Lord say, the children of the ungodly bed shall not bring forth fruit. Right? And in that case, the scripture I'm quoting, that's people who committed adultery, right? Fornicate, and then children came out of it. Right? Okay, so we want to be careful. We want to be careful, Israel. We don't want to tempt the Mosaic. So Ecclesiastes 26, right? And the scripture I was quoting was Ecclesiastes 23 about the children of the ungodly bed. So that's what you can open yourself up to, right, if you take that route. So the answer is don't do that. If we did in the past, don't do it again, right? And if you didn't do it, don't start doing it. So we had Ecclesiastes 26 in the Apocrypha, which is part of the King James Bible. We want the 22nd verse to about the 26th verse. Very good information. So it says, an harlot, what's a harlot? A whore. A woman that sleeps around. Some of them get paid for it, some of them don't. But an harlot shall be accounted as spittle. You see what the Lord feel about that? Because he didn't create the woman to, be, to, to have all these multiple sex partners. But a married woman is a tower against death to her husband. So when you look at the battlements of war, and you have the big towers with, with archers in the towers and, and, right, military. So he compared a married woman, she's going to protect her husband in a righteous way, even against himself. Like Sarah protected Abraham and told him the things of the Lord to help him get back on track. That's a wife, man. A wicked woman is given as a portion to a wicked man. See, so when we say the Lord is the matchmaker, you want to be wicked, guess what you're going to get? He ain't going to stop you. The wicked woman ends up to the, with the wicked man. But a godly woman is given to him that feareth the Lord. See, you see that? 
So do the Lord lie? So if we trying to follow God and we single and you ain't got no woman, that means you got to wait. You going to know because she going to be into everything you into when it comes to these scriptures, man. The Lord put that spirit on people where they only see you, but you got to be patient. So the Lord is the matchmaker. He get a wicked to the wicked and the godly to the godly. Right? So that means we got to be godly, brothers and sisters. So it says a dishonest woman contemneth shame, meaning contemneth means to hate, to despise. So a woman that's not on the up and up, she's dishonest, she's deceitful. She hates discretion. Shame in this context, shame means discretion. She hates that. So she's going to wear provocative clothing. She's going to be indiscreet. She's going to be loud. She's going to be all up in men's face. She's going to be loose because she's deceitful. But an honest woman will reverence her husband. He don't have to worry about nothing. He don't, no matter where she's at in the earth, she's going to maintain her marriage. She's not going to go behind his back. She's going to stand for what he stand for, God. A shameless woman shall be counted as a dog. You see that? So a lot of these women that they promoting in, in the music videos and all, that ain't how the Lord see it. These women got no shame. They up on the stage twerking. They got their legs wide open doing splits and twerk, all kinds of stuff. Super Bowl halftime shows and all kinds of stuff is terrible, Israel. The only one love that is dogs. See? So a shameless woman shall be counted as a dog, and you got men that act like dogs. And that's why they drawn to the nasty girls. And what you going to get? Foolishness. Right? It's all, all fun and party until the domestic stuff start. And then now all of a sudden the hatred comes out. And, and, and now what you originally thought of the girl, I can't stand that such and such and such and such while you got on an orange jumpsuit in prison because you didn't know the wisdom of these scriptures. You chased the wrong kind of woman. So a shameless woman shall be counted as a dog, but she that is shamefaced, meaning discretion, she keeps a reputation. She understands that she has to hold virtue. She understands that she has value. She's not going to play herself in the streets. She's going to be for one man. And you got to be good enough so when she show up, you're ready. But she that is shamefaced will fear the Lord. That's the kind of woman you want, brother. One that fears the Lord, reverence God. And you reverence God, man, that's a, that's a hot combination right there. A woman that honoreth her husband shall be judged wise of all. But she that dishonoreth him, right, she disrespectful. She dishonored him in her pride shall be counted ungodly of all. See that? So that ain't the only scripture like that. There's plenty of scriptures where the woman has to understand her role, that her, the husband is her head. Right? As God and Christ is over the man, the man is over the woman. Right? That's the order. The Most High first, then Christ, then the Israelite man, then the Israelite woman. That's found in, the, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. And three, you can look it up yourself, 1 Corinthians 11 and three. That's the order from the beginning. But a woman that thinks she's your equal and she's disrespecting you and talking crazy. But see, you chased the beauty and didn't see that coming. She got a nasty disposition about her. She got a bad attitude. So she pretty on the outside, but she ugly on the inside. And this is where you get women that get choked. Brothers end up in prison. Brothers get a record now. Oh, what's on his record? Domestic abuser. So now he can't get a job. So see what you thought was funny. Now you don't chase the woman. Now you done messed up your income in life because you got that foolishness on your record. Do you think society cares? They promoting you to destroy yourself. And we already read in the scriptures, man, the future to come. The Lord's getting rid of all the adultery and the foolishness and the fornication. 
So we can't be connected to any of that, Israel. We got to learn something. So with that said, we'll end the class. Um, let's end with a prayer. All praises. So, Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ, thank you for your holy word. Bless us in all things. Help us to, to learn and grow and to perform these scriptures and help us to endure temptation so that we fail not. Guide us, and for those that want marriage, help them to be patient. Give them the spirit to endure through your spirit and give them the spirit to acknowledge that which is right and true. Therefore, they may be properly married in the proper time. All praises. Thank you, Father, in the name of Christ. As for those that are married, bless us and according to your mercies that we may be aged together unto the grace of eternal life. In Christ's name we pray and believe. Thank you, Amen. All right, Israel. So my name's Brother Aram. Okay, I'm an elder, but I'm your brother first, right? And Lord willing, we're going to get there together. But we just got to do it God's way, the Most High's way. All praises. So Shalom, peace and blessings to you and all that that's yours. Uh, and, and stay blessed. All right.